week. Uh, we're very pleased to have Adam Cohen joining us from Harvard University. Adam actually is an undergraduate at Harvard in chemistry and physics, uh, did a PhD in theoretical physics at Cambridge University, and then was apparently a uh, glutton for punishments and did another PhD in experimental biophysics at Stanford University. He's found his way back to Harvard, where he's now on the faculty, as well as being uh, uh, Howard Hughes uh, medical student investigator. Uh, at the, number of awards that he's won for his work is uh, too numerous to mention here, but I'll point out they include both the kind of traditional academic awards, like the P-Case Award, um, the top award given to junior faculty from the federal government, as well as uh, notable mentions in the popular press, including things like technology review and popular science. Um, if you are not excited enough about the research work uh, and you want to talk to him about other things, I would maybe recommend his entrepreneurial activity or his work in Liberia trying to advance science education there. So with that, we're very pleased to have Adam with us. Uh, tell us today about his work advancing optical techniques for electricity outlets. Great. Thank you, Chris, for that uh, very kind introduction and for the invitation to come down here. And thanks to all of you for coming here today. I've never given a talk with two microphones before. One of them is for the room. The other is for a new um, FBI program monitoring subversive academics. It's part of our new uh, administration's policies. So um, I'm going to tell you today about uh, my lab's efforts to uh, develop tools to monitor electrical activity in uh, neurons. We've developed a protein which, uh, when you express it in a cell, it converts uh, electrical spikes into flashes of fluorescence that you can see in a microscope. And uh, this is real data, a single trial recording from a neuron. And that's basically all I have to say today. So that's the whole story. Okay? <laughs> but before I take questions, I'll go into a little bit more detail. And as Chris said, by way of disclosure, I've started a uh, company which is working on developing some aspects of this technology. So in our heads, we have uh, about 86 billion neurons. And these neurons communicate to each other with little electrical impulses that are about a tenth of a volt tall and about a millisecond wide. And this is the internal language of our nervous system. Every thought and feeling and experience we have is uh, represented by these electrical impulses. So we'd really like to see these patterns of activity. This is an artist's representation of what we want to do. We want to make neurons light up when they fire. The challenge is that you can't see uh, the voltage directly in a cell any more than you can see the voltage in this wire just by looking at the wire. There's very little endogenous contrast associated with this electrical activity. And so we need some sort of a contrast mechanism to convert these changes in voltage into an optical signal that we can see. People have been working on this for uh, decades with trying a variety of different uh, contrast mechanisms. And so I'll tell you today about our efforts to develop a new type of contrast mechanism. The story starts here. This is a view of the Dead Sea between Israel and Jordan. Now the Dead Sea is not really dead. There are microorganisms that live here in the water. And one of these microorganisms is a um, archaeal creature called uh, Halorubrum sodomense. And this creature produces a transmembrane protein, which it uses to capture uh, sunlight to power its metabolism. This protein uh, has seven transmembrane alpha helices and a chromophore retinal covalently bound in the core of the, cell, of the protein. This chromophore absorbs sunlight. That drives a uh, trans to cis isomerization around a double bond in the chromophore, which then induces a series of conformational uh, changes, which has the net result that a proton goes from inside the cell to outside the cell. That builds up a membrane voltage. Those protons then come back through the ATP synthase. They turn the line, makes ADP and phosphate, and makes ATP. And that's how this creature makes a living from sunlight. So you can think of this like the world's smallest photovoltaic device. Light comes in, and a membrane voltage comes out. So a few years ago, I said to myself, I wonder if we can run these proteins in reverse. Instead of having light come in and a change in voltage come out, I thought maybe we could somehow use a change in the voltage in the cell to produce an optical signal that we could detect. Okay? So instead of light in and voltage out, we run voltage in and light out. So now I'm going to skip several years of hard work and tell you that we found a way to do this. 
we discovered that these proteins are a little bit fluorescent. They can be excited by red light, and they emit near infrared. The fluorescence comes from the retinal, from the chromophore, which is covalently bound in the core of the brain. So this is a new class of fluorescent proteins with no homology to GFP or any other known fluorescent protein. But it turns out these proteins are only fluorescent when there's a proton sitting on a particular functional group in the core of the protein. So the protonated state is fluorescent, and the deprotonated state is not. So you can think of them like a pH indicator. It's a, okay, it's a fluorescent pH indicator. Now, this protonation-deprotonation equilibrium has associated with it a motion of this uh, charge, of the proton. It's either on the protein or not on the protein. And so if there's a change in the membrane voltage, that um, intramembrane electric field can tilt the uh, relative free energies of the protonated and deprotonated states. And so you can control this acid-base equilibrium by changing voltage. Essentially, the proton is charged, and so you can push it onto the molecule or pull it off by changing the membrane voltage. And that modulates the fluorescence of the protein. So um, just like this. And you can see this works in PowerPoint, so that's very encouraging. <laughs> All right. Now I'll show you some data. This is a um, hex cell. It's a human tumor cell where we're expressing this protein. You can't see it in the picture, but there's a little patch pipette stuck in the back of the cell. And I'll show you a movie now where we apply steps of voltage between plus and minus a uh, tenth of a volt. And this is with this native protein straight out of the Dead Sea. And we're exciting with red light, and we're looking at the fluorescence in the near infrared. And so this is what we see. Okay? And so what you can see is when the voltage goes up, the fluorescence gets bright, and when the voltage goes down, the fluorescence gets dim. This protein turns out to have about a two-fold change in fluorescence over a physiological voltage range. It's almost linear with voltage, and it responds very fast, in less than a millisecond. So it's fast enough, in principle, to detect action potentials from neurons. So then we took the gene for the protein, and we put it into a virus. We got some uh, uh, rat brains, and we mushed them up and cultured the neurons in a dish. We infected the neurons with a virus, so they started expressing the protein. And then we looked at the fluorescence in the microscope. I'll show you a movie here of a rat hippocampal neuron. There's a patch pipette stuck in the back of the cell, which we're using to uh, trigger the cell to fire with little uh, injections of current. You can't see the pipette in the fluorescence uh, movie. And uh, this is a movie at 1,000 frames a second. We have to image very fast because these action potentials are so brief. So this is what we see. Okay. And so uh, for the first time, it was possible to really see a single action potential in a uh, mammalian neuron in culture here. On the left are some examples of fluorescence recordings averaging over the whole cell and simultaneously acquired patch clamp recordings. This is now with an engineered version of this protein where we mutated it to make the fluorescence brighter and a little bit more sensitive to voltage. Here's a close-up, and you can see the correspondence of the optical signal and the electrical signal here. This is single trial data. Now, in these uh, examples, we were using a patch pipette to uh, trigger the cell to fire. But going in with a patch pipette uh, partially defeats the purpose of having this nice optical readout, because we have to go and very laboriously poke individual cells in order to uh, measure them. Now, um, independent of our work uh, and preceding our work, uh, many other people had developed light-gated ion channels. These are proteins where you can shine uh, blue light on them, and they'll pass a uh, membrane current, which can trigger a cell to fire. So I said to myself, why don't we just co-express in the same cell a blue light-activated ion channel and a red light-activated voltage indicator, and then we can have a bidirectional optical interface so we did this, um, working with Ed Boyden's lab at MIT. We developed a new channel rhodopsin. Uh, this is derived from a uh, freshwater alga, which lives in a pond in the south of England. Uh, it's just like the other channel rhodopsins, but more sensitive to light. And then uh, working with Robert Campbell's lab at the University of Alberta, we engineered these voltage indicators to be faster and more sensitive to voltage. And so the idea is we can flash blue light on a cell. That will trigger the cell to fire uh, by activating the channel rhodopsin. And then we'll see the response via the red excited near-infrared emission of the voltage indicator. So again, that's a cartoon of what we'll do. Uh, 
here's some data. These are recordings from uh, rat hippocampal neurons in culture. Each blue bar here represents a flash of blue light delivered to the cell. The red is the fluorescence recording, and the black is the simultaneously acquired patch clamp recording. Here's a close-up, and um, again, you can see the correspondence of the optical and electrical signals. But now we're just using the patch pipette for ground truth to uh, check that we're um, you know, the correspondence of the real voltage and the fluorescence. But we don't need the patch pipette uh, anymore in these experiments. We can do uh, just optical stimulation and optical recording from the cells. Now, a neat thing about using light to record from cells is that you can do this in a spatially resolved uh, way. So rather than just looking at the voltage at a single point, you can map a voltage over a large area. We developed a machine to do this. It's, uh, it has a gigantic objective. Uh, we call this our Coke can microscope because the objective is about the size of a soda can. And this objective can image a large field of view with very high light collection efficiency. Here's a picture of um, a culture, again, of rat hippocampal neurons. This is about a millimeter by three millimeters. So there's about 50 or so cells here. All of these cells are expressing the uh, voltage indicator and the optogenetic actuator. I'll show you a video where at a certain point we'll turn on a blue light over the whole field of view to uh, stimulate all of the cells in parallel. And uh, this movie is at 500 frames a second, slowed down about uh, tenfold so that uh, we can see uh, what's going on. There'll be a little icon which shows up here when we stimulate the cells. Okay. And so now you can actually see every uh, action potential and every subthreshold event in all of these cells in the culture. Now these movies generate a big uh, data analysis problem for us. We get data off of the camera at about a gigabyte per second. And so storing that data and figuring out how to handle it is sort of a technical challenge. And then the interpretation is um, a major um, challenge. You know, people have been working on trying to do voltage imaging for, for decades. And I think there hasn't really been sufficient attention to what do you do once you get it to work? What, how do you actually interpret the data? So just to give you a flavor of the kinds of things that we are thinking about, in these movies, um, I think of it a little bit like spaghetti and meatballs, where the meatballs are the cell body, and the spaghetti um, is all the dendrites and axons, which are all interwoven with each other. At any individual pixel in the movie, we tend to record a linear combination of signals from many neurons. They're all overlapping with each other. So the first challenge is to disentangle these different signals in order to identify the components due to the individual cells. There's an analogous problem in uh, the speech processing community, which is called the cocktail party problem, which is what do you do if you have lots of people talking in the room and you want to tune in to individual voices? There are statistical techniques developed for addressing that problem, and so we've borrowed some of those um, ideas for trying to disentangle to find independent components of the signal in these mixed uh, movies. I come uh, recordings like this. So here's an example where we're stimulating the cells with pulses of blue light of successively greater intensity. We can record now from thousands of these cells, and the next challenge is to interpret these firing patterns. So encoded in the firing rates and the waveforms and the interspike intervals, there's a lot of information about the underlying physiology of the cells. But the inverse problem of going from these recordings to statements about what ion channels um, are active in the cells is not a solved problem. And that's something we're still trying to figure out how to do. But nonetheless, we can get large amounts of data uh, doing this. And so we can use it in some ways to sort of fingerprint cells. So here I'll give you an example. Um, here, rather than working with uh, primary rodent neurons, I wanted to work with human neurons. And I asked my students if any of them would donate their brains so that we could mush them up and culture the cells in the dish. And they were uh, bizarrely reluctant to do this. And so um, instead, I turned to one of my friends in the stem cell department at Harvard who works with human-induced pluripotent stem cells. So the trick is that every cell in our body is pretty much genetically identical. The only thing that distinguishes skin from blood from brain is uh, which genes are turned on. And people now know how to take some skin or blood from anybody and to reprogram those cells back through embryonic development to turn them into a stem cell-like state and then to take those cells down a different developmental pathway to turn them into neurons, which you can grow in a dish, 
and those neurons they'll wire up and they'll start to fire, and they're genetically identical to the neurons in the head of the person who gave the scan. And so this is, in a sense, a roundabout way of getting a brain biopsy. Now the cool thing about this is you can do this either on cells derived from a healthy person or on cells derived from somebody with a genetically based disease of the nervous system. And then you can compare and contrast and use this as a platform for testing drugs to uh, try to figure out how to make cells behave like cells from a healthy person. And you can now do this on human cells related to real patients uh, where you can then relate what you see in the dish to what you see in the patient. And so um, Kevin Egan and I have been uh, working on that. And here I'll just give you an example of some, uh, what the form of the data look like. Here, um, uh, these are recordings from human IPS-derived uh, neurons. And um, so we, we stimulate them with this pattern down here. Um, and here's some example recordings um, from the cells. Then we go and we find each spike. Here the data are arrayed in a raster graph. So each row is one cell and each point is one spike from that cell. And so these bands correspond to the um, stimulated epochs when we get more activity from the cells. And the thing to note here is just the number of cells that we're looking at here. So here it's about 2,000 cells. Doing this with manual patch clamp at about one cell per hour would be very slow and laborious. And here's an example where we added a, a drug to the cells. And down here I'm showing the average firing rate, so averaging across the rows as a function of time during the stimulus. And you can see subtle effects of these pharmacological perturbations on the electrophysiology of the cells. These would be very difficult to detect by uh, conventional means because there's a lot of cell-to-cell -cell variability. And uh, recording enough cells to overwhelm that variability um, is uh, not really feasible, at least with conventional manual patch clamp. Now, maybe with automated patch clamp or uh, other, other robotic approaches, it might start to become feasible. Anyway, so this is a, a way of getting a lot of data on these stem cell-based neurons. So here I'll give you an example of an application of this to a disease model. Um, Kevin and I were interested in studying um, a model of ALS. So this is a neurodegenerative disease uh, which afflicts uh, motor neurons, uh, and um, it typically um, affects adults, and it causes paralysis and ultimately death, and there's no uh, treatment for this disease right now. And so uh, lab, they um, took some skin from a patient who had um, ALS. This patient had a particular point mutation which was causal for the disease, a, a single um, point mutation in the SOD1 gene. They made stem cells from this patient and then split the pool into two populations. In one of the populations, they edited the genome to correct this single point mutation. So this way we have two populations of cells that are genetically identical in every way except for the single point mutation which is causal for the disease. Okay? So this lets us do a sort of matched uh, comparison. Then they differentiated those cells into motor neurons and then we uh, took them into the lab and we optopatched them. And so um, here's again the, the data. So here um, these are the disease cells and some control cells as we stimulate them. Now, there are a lot of ways to analyze these patterns of dots, but uh, the simplest, again, is just to average the rows together to look at the spike rate as a function of time during the stimulus. And what I want you to see here is that um, there's a difference between the red trace, which are the uh, mutant cells, and the black trace, which are the controls. And these uh, two cell lines only differ in that single point mutation in uh, this one gene. Based on recordings like this, and now this is not my work, this is work that Kevin did with uh, uh, Clifford Wolf at Boston Children's Hospital. Kevin and Clifford inferred that these differences in excitability pointed to a deficit in a uh, particular uh, potassium channel, the KV7 potassium channel in these cells. Now it turns out that there is an FDA approved drug, ritigabine, which is an agonist, an activator of that channel, which is used for treating epilepsy. And so Kevin and Clifford hypothesized that perhaps um, ritigabine could um, correct this functional deficit in, uh, in the human-derived motor neurons, and it did. And it also prolonged the survival of the human motor neurons in the dish, suggesting that uh, this electrophysiological phenotype is somehow on the pathway toward the disease progression. So on the basis of that, uh, GSK, which owns ritigabine, has started a clinical trial of that drug for ALS. And we don't know if it'll work or not, but that's uh, ongoing right now. 
All right, so um, I've been talking to you about spiking of neurons. After a neuron spikes, that leads to um, vesicle release at the synapse and a signal to the next cell. And so there's a lot of interesting biology and signal processing that happens at the synapse itself. And uh, synaptic dysfunction is implicated in many, many diseases of the nervous system. They're these incredibly complex machines. And so we thought it would be nice to develop a uh, tool for specifically measuring synaptic function uh, in these cultured neurons. While it's challenging to do patch clamp measurements to record excitability of individual cells, measuring synaptic function is doubly challenging because it requires patching typically onto pairs or more of, of uh, connected cells. So we developed a um, genetic construct to look at synaptic function. And here's how it works. We um, use two separate constructs, one for the channel rhodopsin and one for the voltage indicator. Both of these constructs are under control of an enzyme called the Cree recombinase. The channel rhodopsin is naturally off. It's not expressed. But in the presence of the Cree recombinase, it gets turned on. The voltage indicator is naturally on. And in the presence of the Cree recombinase, it gets off. We take both genes, and we deliver them at high titer to all of the cells. And then we take the gene for the Cree recombinase, and we sprinkle it in uh, partially. So only a, a set of the cells get that gene. So that takes cells uh, which are naturally like this, and it flips them like that. Right? And so this way, every cell expresses either the channel rhodopsin or the voltage indicator, but no cell expresses both. And so here, here's a picture of one of these cultures. The uh, point of this is that now we can flash the um, cells with light. The channel rhodopsin expressing cells fire, but we don't see that activity because they don't have a reporter in them. We only see the response in the postsynaptic cells which have the voltage indicator. And we only see a response if they get a synaptic input. So this is a way of isolating the synaptic component of the signal. Here's an example recording. These are spontaneous spikes from a postsynaptic cell. And then these little divots here are the postsynaptic uh, potentials in the downstream cell. And if we average them together, you can see this nice um, excitatory postsynaptic potential here. Using this technique, we can then start to explore um, mechanisms of synaptic plasticity in these cultured neurons. Another sort of useful attribute of these optical recordings is that you can come back to the same cells day after day. And so you can look at long-term changes in their electrophysiology. Here's an example. Um, here, the postsynaptic potential shows both an excitatory component here, as well as an inhibitory component. Remember, we're stimulating many presynaptic cells, and so you get a mixture of excitatory and inhibitory uh, inputs. Then we add gabazine to that same cell, and that blocks the GABA receptors. And so now the inhibitory component is gone. And we only see the excitatory component, including a slow NMDA-mediated component. If we leave the gabazine in for a couple of days, the spontaneous network bursts go away. But still, we only see the um, excitatory components. And then if we wash out the gabazine and come back to the same cell again, now the inhibitory component has come back. And it's uh, accentuated relative to what we saw at the beginning because of a homeostatic upregulation of this inhibitory signaling because there had been no inhibitory signaling in the culture during those two days. And so this is an example of uh, how you can use this to study long-term plasticity in these uh, cultured. Okay. Now, in the examples I showed you so far, we were just using flood illumination to stimulate all the cells. But a neat aspect of using uh, light to stimulate the cells is that you can also pattern the light to stimulate different cells in the culture or different subcellular regions. We, de we developed a machine to do that. It's basically uh, based on a hacked video projector. So these projectors up here that are displaying these images have little uh, microchips in them, which have an array of microscopic mirrors. It's, it's one mirror per pixel here on this image. And these mirrors can be turned on and off in order to modulate the light. And that's how this image gets projected. We took one of those micro mirror devices and used it to modulate the blue light on its way into the microscope. Instead of projecting a big image onto a screen, we, we demagnify the image and we project a microscopic image onto the sample. So each pixel then maps to a corresponding spot on the sample. Okay? Then we use flood illumination with red light to look at the fluorescence over the whole field of view.
And so these projectors typically have about a million pixels on them. And so this gives us a million independently tunable uh, stimulus points that completely tile the sample. And the camera has about a million pixels on it. And so we have about a million independent uh, recording points that also tile the sample. So now instead of doing uh, patch clamp measurements where we have one input and one output, we have about a million inputs and a million outputs. Just to demonstrate um, the optical patterning, I took a video from YouTube and projected it into the microscope onto a fluorescent film. So there's no cells here. This is just a fluorescent exposure target. And now I'll show you the pattern of the blue light viewed inside the microscope. Okay? So this is the pattern of light that we're projecting um, into the sample. And just for scale, a single cell is about the size of the clown's head. So you can really stimulate in any pattern of space and time that you can dream up. Great. So now I'll show you an example of how we've used this for uh, circuit mapping. This is um, sort of a toy example. We're dealing here uh, still with cultured neurons. So it's not a real brain circuit. It's uh, neurons that have been randomly thrown down in the dish uh, and now will stimulate, so we'll target the blue stimulus just to this purple cell here. And I'll show you a movie of what we see when we stimulate that cell. So um, just to orient you, red is a depolarization voltage going up, blue is a hyperpolarization voltage going down. So we stimulate here, and then we get some sort of a complicated response, and then I think we'll stimulate again and we'll get some other responses, uh, and so on. Now, I want to walk you through in some detail how we interpret this data to try to pick apart the circuit. So um, here are the um, fluorescence recordings from the different circled cells here. Purple is the cell we're stimulating, and then these other colors represent these other cells. Let's zoom in on this first uh, stimulus epoch right here. So here's the zoom in. So we stimulate the purple cell, and it spikes. About 12 milliseconds later, we see a spike in this green cell over here. About 14 milliseconds after that, we see spikes in the magenta and orange cells over here. And then as soon as those cells spike, we see these strong inhibitory uh, signals in the green yellow cell as well as back in this purple cell over here. This tells us that the orange cell or the magenta cell, one of those two is an inhibitory neuron. Okay? And so here you can see this nice inhibitory postsynaptic potential in the cell that we originally stimulated with an excitatory input. So there's an inhibitory feedback here. So now let's look at how this plays out as we stimulate the cells again. So that's the first stimulus. Now we'll deliver five more stimuli. In the first stimulus, again, the purple cell spikes. That makes the green cell spike, which makes the orange and magenta cell spike. And then we get the inhibitory signal in the yellow, green, and purple cells. Now, for the second stimulus, this purple cell is still inhibited. And so it doesn't spike. We only get a subthreshold uh, potential here. And because this cell doesn't spike, then the chain ends, and we see no response in any of the other cells. This establishes the causality that it was the spike in this purple cell that, that induced the responses in the other cells. Now for the third stimulus, now this purple cell has recovered, and so it can spike again. But the green cell is still subject to this inhibitory feedback that it got pr from the previous um, uh, round. And so the green cell only gives a subthreshold event and doesn't spike. And the chain ends, and we see no signal in any of the other cells. Then in the fourth stimulus, now the purple cell has recovered, the green cell has recovered, and so then you get um, stimulation to these inhibitory cells, you get the inhibitory feedback, and so then in the fifth stimulus, it's back to like the second stimulus where the purple cell doesn't spike again. Okay, and so just by chance, this thing has landed sort of like a counter where every fourth stimulus the uh, cycle repeats. Now again, this is a um, unnatural circuit, uh, but I think this gives a flavor of the kind of thing you would hope to do uh, for um, circuit mapping and more um, intact preps. I should say, it's going to be much harder to do this in real tissue where the postsynaptic potentials are much smaller. They're about 10 times smaller in um, real tissue than they are in cultured neurons. Okay, so that's the circuit. All right, 
So, so far, we've been uh, treating these cells as uh, units, as though the whole cell spices once, at once. But of course, we know that these signals actually have to propagate through the cell. And we wanted to see the propagation of the signals. The challenge here is that these action potentials are so fast. They only last about a millisecond. And even with the fastest cameras that money can buy, we can only um, detect these events. We can't really see the subcellular details of the propagation. One of my students came up with a very clever computational trick for mapping the propagation with much higher time resolution than the exposure time of the camera. And here's how it works. So we'll optically stimulate and record from a cell. And then if we look at a single pixel in this movie, and we plot the fluorescence intensity as a function of time, when the cell spikes, we see the fluorescence go up and it comes back down. And here we're sampling at discrete intervals corresponding to the one millisecond exposures of our camera if we're going at 1,000 frames a second. Okay? But now we have additional information about what the cell is doing. We know that this action potential is a smoothly varying function of time that goes up and comes back down. And so we can fit an interpolation to these uh, discreetly sampled data points. And then we can set a threshold. And we can ask, when does this interpolated function cross the threshold? And we can do that with a precision better than the exposure time of the camera. We then make a new movie where we subdivide each frame into many frames. And we only show a flash at the time corresponding to the wavefront crossing this threshold. So this is a model-based interpolation algorithm. Okay? There's a, actually a similar trick which people have used for quite a while in um, single molecule fluorescence microscopy. So if you have a fluorescent molecule on a cover slip and you look at it, the image of that molecule is blurred out in space right, by diffraction. But people have known now for a while that you can fit that broad point spread function and localize the molecule in space with a precision much better than the spatial resolution of the microscope. This is the basis for many of the so-called super resolution microscopies. Right? It's just like if you're climbing a mountain. The mountain can be very broad, but you know when you're at the peak. So here, we're essentially taking that idea from the spatial domain and just rotating it into the time domain. And this actually works. Here, I'll show you an example. Here, we're optically stimulating the cell body. And so there's no electrodes here. First, I'll show you the movie at the native frame rate of the camera, so um, 1,000 frames a second. And this movie is averaged over a few hundred repetitions of the experiment to improve the signal-to-noise ratio. Okay? And so you can see the cell spike, but you can't really see the propagation because we're um, just not fast enough. The camera's too slow. The spike only lasts a few frames. So now we'll apply that sub Nyquist interpolation algorithm to those data. And now I'll show you a map of the action potential wavefront interpolated to 20,000 frames a second, 50 microseconds a frame. And the thing to remember here is that we're processing each pixel independently. So we don't impose any wave-like motion on the data. Any waves we see are really there in the underlying structure of the data. And so this is what we see. Okay. And so you can actually see uh, in detail now how this action potential is propagating through the cell. Here's another example where we're optically stimulating, again with our video projector, uh, just the cell body. The raw data were taken at one millisecond of frame. This movie is interpolated to 10 microseconds of frame, or 100,000 frames a second. Okay. And again, you can see in detail how these impulses are propagating through the cell. We can use this technique to explore how um, different kinds of dendritic inputs get integrated in a cell to generate an action potential. Here's an example where we're optically stimulating just a little patch of dendrite on the edge of the cell. This movie is interpolated to 50,000 frames a second. And I want you to pay close attention to where you see the action potential initiate. So we're stimulating over here. And if you look closely, it looks like the action potential is starting on this little noodle over here that you can barely see, right? someplace other than where we're stimulating. See it? And so what's going on? How can it be that the signal is starting, the impulse is starting someplace other than where we stimulate? Well, we think that in a neuron, inputs come from the dendrites, 
And then the threshold for triggering an action potential is lowest at the axon initial segment, where the axon joins to the cell body. That's where the density of the channels is highest, and that's where the spike starts. And then the spike goes down the axon and back through the cell body and into the dendritic tree. And so we hypothesized that maybe we were seeing here the um, uh, spike initiation in the axon initial segment. So maybe this little noodle is the axon. To test that hypothesis, we then took this cell and we immunostained it for anchor in G, which is a marker of the axon initial segment. So now I'll show you an overlay of the immunostaining data um, where the anchor in G is labeled in red and uh, the rest of the cell is labeled in green. Okay. And so this is the immunostaining, and here's the axon initial segment. And so you can see that the action potential really is starting at the distal end of the axon initial segment. And so these um, highly processed sort of computed maps really do have a correspondence to the underlying uh, biochemical structure inside of these cells. All right. OK, so, so far I've been talking um, just about cells and culture. But of course, we really want to look at brains. And you know, the dream is to look in a mouse and to tickle its tail or something and to look at patterns of uh, electrical impulses going through its brains. But this is the problem. The brain is not transparent, and it's three-dimensional. And so it's very hard to um, see what's going on beneath the, circuit, beneath, excuse me, beneath the surface of these brains. There have been uh, great advances in two-photon microscopy for calcium imaging, but it turns out those techniques are not sufficiently fast or sensitive for doing the high-speed uh, voltage imaging uh, that we'd like to do. And so we need to come up with new techniques for imaging in um, in tissue and in vivo. So the remaining time, I'll tell you a little bit about our efforts there. So this is what we want to do. We want to be able to look into the brain and uh, light up the cells. This is an image of a fixed slice. We're nowhere near being able to do this kind of functional imaging yet. But we're working on it. All right. So to get started, we needed to be able to express these uh, genes in vivo. Working with uh, Hankui Zheng's group at the Allen Institute, we developed a transgenic mouse which has this optopatch uh, construct uh, in it. So this is both the channel adoption and the voltage indicator. The mouse um, has a stop cassette in front of the optopatch gene, so it doesn't actually express the protein. The stop cassette is flanked by two uh, Cree recombinase sites. If uh, this gene is exposed to the Cree recombinase, that enzyme cuts out the stop cassette and then turns on expression. So what's the point? Well. Many people have developed mouse lines which express this enzyme, the Cree recombinase, under control of different cell type specific promoters. So if you take one of these mice, uh, say, as the mom, and one of these as the dad, and you mate them, if the offspring gets this gene from the mom and this gene from the dad, then in the cells that express the Cree recombinase, expression is turned on in the pup. Okay? And so this is a way, by playing mating games, to target expression to many different uh, cell types in the offspring. Here's an example where we used the NAV 1.8 promoter to drive expression of this Cree recombinase. Uh, NAV 1.8 is a sodium channel involved in pain, in, uh, in somatosensation. And so this targets expression to the peripheral nervous system. We then took out the DRG from the pups and optically stimulated them and recorded from them. And you can see them spiking away. And here's the patch clamp recording for ground truth. Now, of course, we really want to look in tissue. So by uh, using different types of promoters to drive expression of the Cree, we could target expression to different uh, brain regions in the central nervous system, as well as to different subtypes of cells in the uh, dorsal root ganglia in the peripheral nervous system. And I should say, this isn't just restricted to neurons. There are many interesting electrically active cell types in the body. There's the heart. There's um, possibly interesting electrical activity in um, immune cells and in endothelial cells and so on. And this gives us an opportunity now to explore broadly the role of electrical signaling in vivo. Now, one of the challenges we found uh, working with these mice is that the trafficking um, of the reporter to the plasma membrane was not always fantastic in vivo. We really don't understand what controls the trafficking. And this is sort of a technical point, but it turns out to be very important. The protein has to be in the membrane to report the voltage. That's the only place where the voltage is. We've taken this gene from this bizarre dead sea organism and introduced it into the, the cells, and sometimes the cells don't know what to do with it. 
And for reasons we don't understand, even though the trafficking was pretty good in the cultured neurons, it was often not that good um, in the live animal. And so here's an example of a brain slice where at low magnification, it looks great. You can see all the cells. But if you look at high magnification, you can actually see it's all clustered in intracellular aggregates. And so we don't get much signal. So then we spent a lot of effort uh, trying to introduce um, different trafficking sequences and other mutations to the protein to, in, to improve the trafficking in vivo. And eventually we came up with a sort of third generation version of this, uh, which we show here, where um, you can see now you don't have these aggregates in the cells. And here's just a, a, a glamour shot uh, with, with sparse expression where now you can see the very nice trafficking uh, in vivo. Uh, this is an acute brain slice. So with these uh, constructs, we can now uh, zoom around in an acute brain slice and optically stimulate and record. And so here's raw data. You can see there's some photo bleaching, and you can optically record these uh, cells spiking away. And this now gives us a chance to zoom around in a brain slice and to map the excitability of uh, neurons now in intact tissue over a large region. And so we can typically get up to about 100 cells uh, per brain slice there um, over, over a few hours uh, just poking around uh, a few cells at a time and sort of mapping uh, excitability over large areas. And so we're just starting to do this now to try to map how different genetically specified subtypes of neurons uh, fire over uh, sort of surveying their activity throughout uh, the brain. All right. Now, this improvement in uh, trafficking then raised another uh, challenge for us, which I didn't anticipate. Here's an image of um, um, some brain tissue expressing these um, well-trafficked voltage indicators. And you can see these dark spots. Those are cell bodies. Those, those are the somas. But you can't actually see the membrane around the cell. The problem is that uh, for a neuron in vivo, between 95 and 98% of the membrane is axons and dendrites. The cell body is actually a tiny fraction of the membrane. And so when you have something which is well trafficked and densely expressed, all you see is the haze from this incredibly dense network of axons and dendrites. And basically, the somatic uh, membranes are just lost in the, in, the, um, in the jumble. This is different from calcium imaging. So it's a surface to volume effect. Um, for a soluble calcium reporter, which is in the uh, soma, the soma is about 60% of the volume and the neurites are, are about 40% uh, of the volume. But the soma membrane is only 2% of the area, whereas the dendrites and axon membranes are 98% of the area because they're so skinny. And so for calcium imaging, you can poke a laser someplace in the brain, and you're liable to be inside of a cell. For uh, voltage imaging, you're liable not to be inside of a cell. So this was a problem. Um, so a postdoc in my lab, uh, Yoav Adam, then modified these voltage indicators to have a uh, trafficking motif borrowed from an ion channel, which is expressed only in the soma. And so these, uh, these then get disguised like this ion channel. And so this, they get localized just to the soma of the um, cells. And here now you can actually see uh, the, so the uh, cell bodies a little bit. And so this lets us, uh, so for instance, here, there's a layer of cells. Here you only see the holes. Now you can actually see expression in those cells. And so that, um, uh, restricts the signal to the regions where we have the resolution to image them. So with this, we've uh, just been able to start looking at um, voltage in, uh, in vivo. Uh, so we take anesthetized mice, uh, and we have a window in the skull. And now we can uh, zoom in and make optical recordings um, of uh, cells spiking away in these, in these animals. And this is still early days. We're, we're still trying to figure out what are the right uh, optical systems in order to be able to see deep enough to um, get a lot of cells um, in vivo. But I think there's actually tremendous opportunities for using adaptive optics and structured illumination microscopy techniques to try to um, counteract the uh, scattering that happens in the brain. And so I think that's an area where um, we're continuing to, to push ahead. All right. Um, in the last few minutes, I'm going to tell you about some sort of offbeat applications of these things outside of uh, voltage imaging uh, in the central nervous system. So um, there's a lot of interest in looking at the electrophysiology of different uh, specific ion channels in order to um, both understand their function and as possible therapeutic targets. So an example of this is um, there's a 
ion channel called NAV 1.7. It's a voltage-gated sodium channel, which is involved in mediating our sense of pain. Uh, there's a few individuals uh, who happen to have inherited bad copies of this channel from both parents. And if you don't have either copy of this channel, uh, these, these people are insensitive to pain, uh, otherwise healthy. Uh, but this is, of course, very bad for them because um, they, they don't have uh, any sort of pain feedback. You know, we learn from pain. And so we wanted to explore the electrophysiology of these channels. And so we developed a very reduced system for doing optical electrophysiology on these heterologously expressed channels. And here's how it works. We express um, the sodium channel and an inward rectifier potassium channel, and then the channel adopsin and the voltage indicator. When we optically, st in hex cells, so these are just inert, uh, otherwise uninteresting cells. When we optically stimulate the cells, for low stimuli, we see little um, channel adoption induced depolarizations. And then when the stimulus crosses a threshold, we get a spike in these cells. So we can actually induce um, action potentials in hex cells just by expressing two gated channels. So the sodium channel brings the voltage up, and then the uh, potassium after the sodium channel inactivates, the potassium channel brings the voltage back down. So you really only need two channels to get an action potential, okay? So you can think of these like the world's uh, most minimal neurons, okay? And we actually understand what's going on in these cells. And so we want to do this for studying pain. And here's an example. Um, so these are optical recordings where we stimulate the cells. And as we stimulate them faster and faster, they, they spike away. If we add lidocaine, so lidocaine is an activity-dependent blocker of sodium channels. At low stimulus rates, the lidocaine doesn't do anything. And then when we stimulate the cells fast, uh, you can see the spiking goes away. And so the lidocaine here is showing a um, use-dependent block of the channels, as you would expect uh, for an anesthetic. But now we can do this measurement in a high-throughput format. And so we've actually been using this now for doing uh, drug screens to look for new modulators of these uh, voltage-dependent uh, sodium channels. So here's an example. We um, um, black our negative controls where we stimulate the cells. Red are cells with a uh, state-dependent blocker called amitriptyline. And you can see the state-dependent rundown in the signal. We've now been screening in 384 well plates. And so we characterize the response of the cells by two different parameters. It doesn't really matter what they are uh, that describe the shape of the spiking. And so red here are positive controls, amitriptyline. Uh, green are negative controls, DMSO. And you can see they're well separated. And then each blue circle here is a different drug from a library of FDA-approved compounds. Of course, most drugs don't block the channel. A few of them do. And if we look for drug here, which shows behavior very much like the uh, amitriptyline, so this was a blinded screen, that drug turned out to be doxepin. You don't need to be a pharmacologist to see that doxepin probably works through a mechanism similar to amitriptyline. And so the screen is now pulling out compounds with similar mechanisms of action um, uh, that work on these channels. And so this gives us a high throughput assay for state-dependent sodium channel modulators. And now we're doing this on other uh, pain-related sodium channels, too. If, if you're a sodium channel jock, uh, NAV 1.9 is a very hard target, which uh, now we're uh, working on. Okay. So now I'm going to tell you something surprising we saw with these cells. So I showed you how we could trigger them to fire with light. But sometimes, um, so once we were patching these cells with, with a patch pipette, and we saw that the cells were firing spontaneously. And this was sort of a surprise. We understand how the sodium channel can drive the voltage up, and the potassium channel can drive it back down. But we didn't understand what was re-triggering the firing. Right? So why are they automatic? So then we looked with a voltage indicator at the cells in the culture. And now I'll show you a movie of what we saw. This is a way zoomed out movie. So this is six millimeters on a side. So there's maybe 100,000 cells in this field of view. You can't see the individual cells. And this is what we saw. Okay. So what we discovered is that these cells are communicating to each other electrically. When the hex cells become confluent, they endogenously express uh, connections. And so when one cell spikes, it can trigger its neighbor to spike and so on. And so you get these collective waves of um, electrical activity which uh, become re-entrant. So, so they make these spiral waves. And if you look at a single cell, as the wave sweeps over it, you see this periodic activity. So now we started to have fun and games with this. Here I'll show you an example where we've patterned the hex cells just using microcontact printing. Um, 
into uh, stripes. This is actually a serpentine pattern. So these stripes are connected out of the field of view. And then we have these different islands. And now we'll stimulate them with patterned illumination. Again, this is a huge field of view. This is several millimeters on a side. And so we can induce these waves. And the waves go back and forth and back and forth like this, right? Uh, and so you can look at their conduction. And then, oh, there, there's a defect here. And so it eventually uh, dies. And um, then you can stimulate the cells with uh, different patterns of space and time, add different uh, ion channel blockers, and sort of explore uh, things like the transition from regular beating to chaos, um, which, um, of course, can happen in the heart as well. And this is a rudimentary model of what might happen during uh, arrhythmogenesis in the heart. What turns out to be interesting to me is even in this model, we actually cannot predict when the thing will go chaotic or uh, arrhythmogenic. And so, um, you know, it, it, we've still got a long way to go to understand what would happen in a more complex tissue like the heart. And here's just uh, for fun an example where we pattern the cells into um, annuli, and we developed a protocol for launching directional waves. You'll see it in a second. And so then these waves now go around and around, uh, chasing their tails. And this turned out to be a stable uh, pattern. These waves can go around for hours on end, thousands of revolutions. And so I, I like to call this our cellular cyclotron, right? So, so as these things go around, uh, because you get so many revolutions, you can measure the speed very precisely. And so you can detect very subtle metabolic effects or pharmacological effects, which change the conduction velocity. Okay. So the last thing I'll um, talk about is applications outside of the um, nervous system. So every membrane-bound uh, structure uh, can support a voltage across the membrane. And um, in many cases, this has been just really hard to measure. Uh, so anything that has a cell wall is very hard to get an electrode into. Things that move around, like a sperm, it's very hard to you know, chase a sperm and, a sperm and harpoon it with a, with a pipette. Or things that are, um, uh, have multiple membranes, like, like a mitochondria, um, or things that are very small, have been impossible to patch. And one of the things that excites me about these optical tools is the prospect of exploring bioelectrical signaling throughout life. So for instance, some uh, plants and fungi have membrane volt huge membrane voltages, uh, and we have no idea why they do this. So I'll give you just one example of something surprising we saw when we looked at um, voltage in E. coli. So um, these are just regular E. coli, and uh, we're expressing a voltage indicator in them. We're not doing anything to them. And I'll show you a movie of what we saw. This movie is sped up about six-fold from real time. So we discovered that bacteria generate electrical spikes. And this was a big surprise. Nobody had ever stuck an electrode into any intact bacterium before because they're too small and they have a cell wall. There are millions of species of bacteria in the world, and nobody knows anything about the electrophysiology of any of them. And so we really have no idea um, what's going on here, what's the biology of this, or um, what's the, the sort of physiology, what's regulating these electrical spikes. All right. So um, I've told you about these uh, voltage indicators. Uh, they come from the Dead Sea over here. Uh, they were discovered about uh, 35 years ago by an Israeli uh, botanist who was wading around in the mud describing these uh, seemingly useless uh, creatures. Uh, the channel dopsin we work with comes from a freshwater alga here uh, from the south of England. We fuse the channel dopsin to a fluorescent protein derived from a coral. We fuse the, the voltage indicator to another GFP derived from a jellyfish. And then we actually link these proteins together with a peptide derived from a pig virus. And it's just incredible to me that we can take all these genes, which evolved under totally different circumstances, and staple them together to come up with new functions which have never been selected in the history of evolution. And the only reason we can do this is that ecologists have been wading through the mud for decades describing these um, totally useless um, creatures. And uh, uh, two years ago, I was in Israel, and I met the um, botanist who discovered this creature. And he had no idea that his work from uh, 35 years before had led to this tool, which we're now using to study human neurodegenerative diseases like ALS. So it's very hard to know where basic research will go. All right, so here's the Dead Sea. I told you about these arcuidopsin-based voltage indicators, about this optopatch trick for optical stimulation and recording, about this uh, algorithm for mapping propagation with high time resolution. And now we're applying these tools everywhere we can find a membrane. I've had many fantastic collaborators on this uh, project, um, working on uh, different aspects of both protein uh, engineering as well as applications in mice and fish and stem cells into different disease models. Uh, and of course, in science, like in any sport, 
credit for success really belongs to the athletes much more than to the coach. And I've had some really fantastic scientific athletes working on this project. Joel Kroll um, started this project, oh, where is he? Um, when, when he was a postdoc in my lab, he really bet his career on this. He's now an assistant professor at University of Colorado Boulder, and all these other people contributed to data that I showed today. These people pay the bills. This is my lab. Uh, I'm always looking uh, for new people to join the team, so let me know if you're interested, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Maybe one brief question, we'll take the rest offline. Yes. I have a brief question. I'm, I'm guessing there are other people who want to know. Um, so you talked about in vivo, you're yeah. just getting started. Right now, how deep, how wide, how many cells, that sort of thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's super bad. Um, so um, we can um, about 100 to 150 microns deep. And we've gotten up to 10 cells at a time, but in a relatively small uh, field of view. More typically, it's, it's a handful, you know, five cells or so uh, in parallel. Yeah. What do you think is the like, timeline until? <laughs> <laughs> uh, this, is, this is what I ask my students every day. Um, we're um, in the middle of building um, sort of a behemoth microscope, which has all sorts of adaptive optical elements in it that um, I think will get us somewhat deeper. It's going to be really hard to compete with the field of view or the depth that you can get with two-photon microscopy. So I think um, what we'll get to is more rapidly reconfigurable targeted measurements where you can look at maybe three or four cells at a time, but you get to pick which cells those are. And so it'll be something where maybe you use two-photon imaging to image a big field of view, and then you go around and sort of tile it to record from a handful of cells at a time. Part of the challenge is um, these cells require quite high intensity illumination in order to record from them. And if you have high intensity over a large area, it's just too much power and you end up cooking the, uh, the brain. I should say the, the biggest limitation of the reporters that we've developed is that they're very dim. They're about 50 to 100 times dimmer than GFP. And so it really requires quite intense light and sort of specialized instrumentation in order to get any of the data that I showed you. Let's take the other questions offline. Thank you. Thank you.